In fact, I worked with Rama, and one of the people on my team was Joe Vallejo, who was 747 pilot. And in 1994, this Rama group, not operating in Peru where they got their start, but met near a mountain, Shasta, opened a dimensional portal. And this highly experienced pilot with tens of thousands of hours of flight time got to go in with six other people to a dimensional portal that is a teleportation device, according to Rama. Their cadre, their activists, have had multiple off-planet experiences. One of their people, Fernando Lamaco, I met in 1993, a retired dental surgeon, was part of a Rama mission where five or six of their highest activists went on a mission into the backwaters of the Amazon on the eastern slopes of the Andes, and in a place called Paititi, had an onboard experience after marching 10 days into the jungle, trailblazing to get to this very remote place. Welcome back. I am here with Dr. Joseph Burks. Dr. Burks, welcome. Hi. Okay. So why don't you just very briefly tell the audience about your background? I mean, it's not, I'm not doing you a service. I'm not really giving you a lot of time, but because your background is extensive. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Retired internal medicine doctor. I worked for 30 years for the Permanente Medical Group. And I've also been a lifelong peace and social justice activist. I was raised in a left-wing family in Manhattan. So I was exposed to the trade union movement, the peace movement, the anti-nuclear movement, the civil rights movement. I spent a lot of time as a kid going to demonstrations instead of football games. It was in Manhattan. There was no place you could play football. Mm -hmm. So I got into college and became pre-med. I was active in Medical Committee for Human Rights and other left-leaning social activist groups around medicine. When I was in medical school during the Vietnam War, the young doctors went out and stopped traffic in Boston, going to a march, and was really great, great because the university police, Tufts University Medical School, were protecting us. Usually, we had to worry about being attacked by the police, but we wore our white coats and, and our stethoscopes. And so I knew I'd arrived in the middle class, in the professional class, and got out of college and was active in the we call it occupational health and safety movement, and we worked with trade unions. Then later on, I became part of the citizens' diplomatic, to person-to-person diplomacy. We traveled to the Soviet Union. We're part of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War that got the Nobel Prize in 1985. I was on the board of directors and very active in the Los Angeles chapter. We used to have a slogan, a nuclear bomb detonation could ruin your whole day. And the slogan of our chapter, which was taken over by the national was, we must prevent, but we cannot cure. And there is no cure for nuclear war. So we talked about the medical consequences of the nuclear arms race and what would be the consequences if there was a nuclear war. So those were sort of my activist days. In 19... 89, 90, got involved with an extensive project. My wife wanted a studio, and so we had to renovate the house. And I was working 60 hours a week in the emergency room as an internist. We used to have a place called the ambulance area. We'd admit patients. It wasn't a trauma center, but it was medical emergencies. And I was working a lot. I decided I needed a hobby. And so I went to the local public library and saw a book on ufos and i said oh yeah okay try that you know for some strange reason i was really fascinated and one book led to another i was i suspect i was a contactee all along but you know only had fragmented memories of some strangeness that happened as a child and i went to my first ufo meeting in 1992 and strangely enough there was one of the respiratory texts from my hospital was there and she turned around and was at a meeting where Stephen Greer was giving his initial presentations in 1990. He formed CSETI in 1990, first working group, Shari Adamak in 91, out of mm-hmm. Denver. And I was the second working group in LA in 92. And so for five years, 
I was pretty active in the hum- what I now call human initiated contact events. Prefer not to use the word CE5 for a number of reasons we could get into. And I had tremendous success, at least I considered it. We had numerous sightings. I had missing time driving back from field work, and it was just like I had read in all the books. And I started to have remote viewing, or I should say contact downloads. On two occasions, I was given in advance while I was out in the field with my team, sort of telepathic override, or I knew. I didn't think. I knew that the sighting was going to happen, in one case, 2 a.m., northwest, one craft. It was like I know 2 plus 2 is 4, you know, which is mm-hmm. certain. And sure enough, at 2 o'clock, one UFO, red glowing orb, totally silent, went by a research site in Joshua Tree National Monument. So these were the experiences that g- gave me quite a good handle on the phenomena because not only did I read a lot and was there were people on my team who were tremendous. We had three physicians. We had two PhD psychologists. We had a screenwriter for Hollywood who was a Harvard graduate. I could not build such a team by myself. All of the participants were brought together. There was Preston Dennett, who went on to write 25 or 30 books. He was on my contact team. I know Preston well. He's a, he's a Joe great Piano, man. 747 yeah. pilot for United Airlines who worked with Rama, and he had some great stories to tell about Rama. We can get into that if there's time. So that was my content experience, but there were political and personal reasons that I had to leave CSETI. I was also threatened by people from probably the Central Intelligence, but they never identified themselves as, as a case. That was only one factor. Was There were differences that I had with Stephen Greer, but I still was supportive of the idea of engaging the phenomena, just that I realized that he was not going to go anywhere that I wanted to be. So, When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. And following that, I worked with Rama a bit, and I got to retire from medicine after 30 years at Kaiser and 42 years seeing patients, and now retiree. I've got a blog, contactunderground.org, and there's over 200 articles that I've published and circulate around, and occasionally somebody writes back and tells me, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, but mostly complimentary support of comments. So so that's my experience. And I should say from the beginning, I approached this issue as a social activist mm-hmm. because I was in the anti-nuclear movement and I found out that UFOs had turned off nu- nuclear weapons. And this is something that I was eager to do, that we I really thought that the nuclear arms race was preparation for genocide, and that it was our social responsibility to try to step back from the brink and eliminate nuclear weapons, or at least control them and stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. So if the UFO intelligences were turning off nuclear weapons and and sending a message, then my assumption was they're probably on our side. You can argue that, but there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the phenomena is far more beneficial than it is malignant. And we can get into some of the reasons why I still have a very positive view about contact, although I find somewhat foolish the position of my former mentor and colleague Stephen Greer when he describes all abductions to the machinations of the intelligence services. I think that's totally ridiculous. But about 90% of the people, as you will read, if you bother to 
pick up the book Beyond UFOs, which reported on the free, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Extraordinary Encounters, named after Edgar Mitchell, who worked with Ray to put together the free experiencer survey, where there were some 4,000 people who were answered extensive questionnaires. 90% of the people were either neutral or positive in their encounters. There was a small group who were having a very hard time of at 10% who were the true abductees. And for Stephen Greer to maintain that these people were all being examples of mill labs, military abductions, it just was insulting and stupid. And I was embarrassed, as I am mostly of the time when I hear what he has to say. Although he is a passionate defender of human-initiated contact events, Heiss, not CE5, but Heiss, and I appreciate his ongoing efforts, as well as the work he did in 2001 with the Disclosure Project, which I got to see in its earlier form as Project Starlight. So I guess that's in about seven or eight minutes or less. Hopefully, this is that's Joe. That's great. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. All right. I'm going to go probably a little directly to the you know primary purpose of the interview, which we'll, I think we'll, we'll continue to fill in color as we go along. But okay. why, from an outside observer, me, does it seem that the intelligence community or even just the U.S. government is so persistently fighting disclosure of things that are i think would be rather obvious at this point like i.e we're not alone what is driving that in your opinion to advertise on through glass darkly email through glass darkly ads at gmail.com well it's an assessment that is based on not just my radical perspective in terms of power structure, in terms of who has the power, but it's also something that came right from the uh, CIA itself. My position is that this issue threatens all terrestrial elites, military, economic, political, academic science, as well as certain aspects of the, I should say, factions within the religious community. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reasons why it threatens all terrestrial elites was talked about by a very high-ranking CIA official, Victor Marchetti, who was the author of CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. He was the assistant to the director of the CIA in the 1960s. He became disenchanted with the organization. He resigned and published a scathing critique of the organization where he revealed many of the pernicious operations that, for example, overthrew democratically elected government in Iran, Persia, yep. and also the disaster it's run coup. by Kermit Roosevelt, right? That's right. They saved, yeah. they saved Persia for British petroleum and the American corporate interests as well. And also for United Fruit Corporation, they saved Guatemala from the people who elected the Arbenz regime, who was, who was a leftist, but certainly not a communist. So all over the world, the United States was involved in what they called was a war against communism, but it turned out it was against nationalist movements that were left-leaning and wanted to get a better break for their people in terms of some of the resources that major corporations were benefiting from and not the people. So Victor Marchetti in 2000, I should say 1979, in an obscure journal called Second Look, published a very important article where he outlined why the CIA was involved in suppressing this issue. And I, I'd like to read the bullet points. I'll make it brief because it's somewhat deadening to ha turn into a podcast and have people read to you. But Victor Machetti wrote, my theory is that we have indeed been contacted, perhaps even visited by extraterrestrial beings, and that the U.S. government, too, in collusion with other national powers of Earth, is determined to keep this information from the general public. Three, the purpose of the international conspiracy of silence and ridicule and denial that's, is to maintain a workable stability among the nations of the world and for them, in turn, to retain 
institutional control over their respective populations. We're talking about the planet's people. Mm -hmm. Four, thus for these governments to admit that there are beings from outer space attempting to contact us, beings with mentalities and technological capabilities, obviously far superior to ours, could once fully perceived by the average person erode the foundations of the Earth's traditional power structure, political and legal systems, religions, economic and social institutions could all soon become meaningless in the mind of the public. The national oligarchical establishments, even civilization as we know it, could collapse into anarchy. Five, such extreme conclusions are not necessarily valid, but they probably reflect the fears of the, quote, ruling class of the major nations whose leaders, particularly those in the intelligence business, have always advocated excessive governmental secrecy as being necessary to preserve national security. The real reason for such secrecy is, of course, to keep the public uninformed, misinformed, and therefore malleable. And that's from how the CIA views the UFO phenomena by Victor Marchetti, former assistant to the director of central intelligence. So, so you get a picture right from the horse's mouth of why the CIA has taken this position. And it really is not a very complicated argument to make because number one, and one of the very popular UFO researchers, Stanton Friedman, used to talk about nationalism being the name of the game. And if the people of the world realized that we had been contacted by advanced intelligences, perhaps extraterrestrial, he was a believer in the ET hypothesis, that would undermine the basis for the modern nation state, which is nationalism. People would start seeing themselves in contrast to these others as citizens of one planet, one people. And that would undermine nationalism. And of course, politicians who have taken on the responsibility to defend themselves first and the people second would have their power base undermined. So that, that's one reason political elites find this phenomenon threatening. Economic elites, it's something along the lines of we now are facing uh, a crisis worldwide of global warming and global climate change. And our modern civilization is based on the burning of fossil fuels, which are destabilizing the climate. And as we saw recently in North Carolina, people who moved to that area thinking they would be safe are, are now living through hell on earth. As yeah, they, they were, moved to the mountains. They moved. Right. To, they weren't expecting a hurricane in the mountains. Right. Exactly right. So, so we have to change, but we don't want to because all the wealth and the perks of the modern civilization is based on this empire of oil. Well, we know that the Tic Tac UFOs and all the others we've been seeing are not running on coal, gas, or petroleum. They are using radical energy generating systems, which under safe conditions, and for me, that would be planetary unity, one planet, one people, where we could run the planet for the benefit and eliminate war. If we could get away from our addiction to war and our addiction to cheap oil, then it's conceivable that these advanced cultures might permit to download into our technological culture the secrets of their propulsion systems. Well, people in who run Exxon, Mobil, and all the other fossil fuel industries are not going to like that. So this phenomena threatens the most powerful industry on the planet, and that is the empire of oil and gas. Then in terms of the scientific establishment, academia, they have what is called materialistic view or natural, it's called physicalism. They believe that only matter and energy count that consciousness and thought is somehow an emergent property that comes out of matter and energy well what these yeah, UFOs are right. showing us by dematerializing by engaging in constant telepathic communication with not thousands but probably hundreds thousands of millions of contact experiences they're showing us that the idea of locality and realism are just 
not sufficient to explain what the natural world really is. And so some other philosophical position like idealism, which postulates consciousness as primary, is going to be necessary for us to not only understand why ESP works, why telepathic communications occur with the aliens, but also how they can fly their craft. And one of the stories that circulated about the acquired saucers that the United States government apparently has in secret, and you can just listen to the comments by David Grush last year. Mm -hmm. They have these craft, but they can't fly them. And as one of your previous guests, Grant Cameron, has postulated, they can't fly it because they don't understand how to make the consciousness link with this technology work. And so the academic elite is going to have to realize that just as the revolution of quantum mechanics and relativity replaced Newtonian mechanics, that they're going to have to develop a new way of thinking about the world. And unfortunately, this scientific establishment has played the role of debunking or want to be debunking in terms of fighting against openness on the UFO subject. So science advances one funeral at a time. And when the new generation of scientists come forward who are now being allowed to talk about this, and maybe they'll even be funded, which would be interesting. Uh, I think Avi Loeb was on your program, and they got $10 million, not from traditional scientific sources, but from private donors. That if, this, if scientists are allowed to talk about UFOs and actually investigate, then the old guard who are opposed to this phenomena as they die off will be less of an obstruction. But still, there's considerable weight given to the comments, as illogical as they are, people like Neil deGasse Grass Grassen and those sort of people. So <laughs> I like I love the Freudian slip of Neil deGasse. <laughs> full of gas right well anyway excuse me i slip of the tongue there so so basically i thought it was very appropriate dr burks <laughs> so so we have a, a religious community that's diverse the roman catholic church has a very in my opinion progressive position on this and that they are acknowledging the probability that this is real they have jesuit astronomer priests speaking out they're of the opinion that the power of the Lord is so great that why would that supreme being limit itself, himself, to having life on only one planet? So that the universe is probably full of conscious intelligence beings, and they would be eager to offer the Roman Catholic perspective to space visiting aliens or any other non-human intelligence that engages in dialogue with people. And they are very sophisticated because in the form of the confessional, you have hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who are telling their priests that this is real, what they've seen. Mm -hmm. So the, the Vatican is keeping its secrets, but it's very well informed about the reality of the situation. So you have political power, economic power, academic power, and you have religious power, because unlike the Catholic Church, there are fundamentalist Christians who have a very limited perspective, and they say, if it's not in the Bible, then they must be demons. And in terms of the Pentagon, it's been described by people who are in the know. I'm talking about Luis Elizondo, who acknowledges the existence of a group that has been identified in the past as the Collins elite, mm -hmm. who label this demonic and they say we should not be dealing with this because you're opening the door to the devil so you have segments of the religious community that are fundamentally challenged as fundamentalists they are opposed to revealing this because it undermines their narrow interpretation of scripture so from this analysis what we see in the worldwide ufo cover-up that has been called the ufo truth embargo that this is the way in which the establishment power elites operate and i reject the position that for many years my former colleague has used the word cabal to describe the op opponents of the efforts at being made at disclosure stephen greer has mentioned the evil cabal as if it was a small group of people meeting and yeah secret. it's not organized it's just the incentives are all wrong it's, right. it's hiding in plain view 
You know, right. freedom of press is for those people who own a television network and a printing press. So, and they have a megaphone that's a lot louder than this humble station that we're now communicating on, which I appreciate. Thank you so much for inviting me. Mm -hmm. But if the, if the people who run the corporations are threatened by the phenomena, they have played a major role in the cover-up in collaboration, not with the government, but with special sections of the executive branch run by the president of the United States. And here again, I think Grant Cameron, who's been on your show a number of times, and I've tried to read it and watch everything he says and read everything he, every book he's put out, because Grant Cameron has an excellent analysis. And he, for 30 years, was specialized in the president and UFOs. And it's very clear that the government, in the form of the executive branch, is in the loop, and the CIA and the other defense intelligence agencies have played a major role in running the cover-up. And the reason why people would like to believe that the president is not in the loop is because the CIA is going to promote that because it takes their boss off the hook. If it's mm -hmm. some evil cabal who's meeting in secret, who you can never find out who they are, that's irresponsible. You cannot organize a political response. You cannot identify it. And it takes the heat off the president who is running the major part of the, the cover-up through the defense contractors and through intelligence services. So that, to me, indicates that this issue is potentially destabilizing to the ruling classes. But from the point of view of an ordinary guy, Joe Burks or Joe Sixpack, is this a threat? In my own judgment, clearly it is not. If you analyze the communication that has been occurring for the last 70 years of the modern UFO era, you will find that the experiencers are telling a very complex story. But some of the themes of their dialogues with the phenomena involve concern about the nuclear weapons, concern about the environment, and concern about spirituality. These are indications that this phenomena is playing a helping role in terms of educating us about what we need to do to get this planet into order. They are not going to stop nuclear weapons from being detonate, detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, despite what people like Luis Elizondo say is an example of their indifference. Mm -hmm. I think the message is it's your responsibility. And what they can do is empower us, inspire us. They can say you can destroy your civilization or you can unite on the basis of peace and cooperation, oneness, which is one of the themes that they promote in their communications with us, profoundly spiritual message, which is the message of all our major wisdom traditions, oneness. You can either evolve, not technologically, but spiritually, or you can perish as a civilization. I don't think we're going to destroy the planet because the Earth has done very well through periods of major climate crises. The extinctions that we now see across the board on this planet are part of a series of major eras of extinctions that go back way before even the dinosaurs were wiped out. Mm -hmm. So this planet's capacity to make life is overwhelming. We will not destroy the Earth. And when we say that, it's just another example of our pride, our excessive pride, our hubris. But we can destroy the material basis for our civilization. And whether it be by nuclear war or by environmental collapse, four degrees centigrade of temperature elevation, if it happens, will turn for a period of time this beautiful planet into a hell, living hell. Four degrees would probably lead to the destruction of our civilization. And But the Earth has a way of recovering. But we will suffer be the consequences of our inability to change. So, so I see this as a potential peaceful revolutionary movement that can take the messages of contact, apply it to the larger society, and say, we can do better. 
And in my humble ways, when I was an organizer in this, what was then called the CE5 initiative, I was attempting to put together teams of contact activists to go out into the field and engage the phenomena. And in the process, I learned quite a bit. Now, why doesn't the phenomena come out in a more overt manner, despite what the, I mean, they are communicating to select people, but why not come out and reveal themselves? You mean like, why don't they follow the script on the day the earth stood still, the first one in 1951, you know, where they, they should give us an ultimatum or something like that? Or well, what do you, or, you just, want? or just or just show up to, you know, the common thing is they show up to a football stadium or the, they, they have actually, the White House. There, ha there have been sightings of of tens of thousands of people at, if you get Preston Dennett on the show. Oh, 1952, right. The <laughs> White House overflights, right. But not only that, also concerts. There was a Rolling Stones concert. There's actually a huh. film where they they stop playing music and they're all sort of looking up. And then then you've got then you have he did he did a, a series of articles about drive-in movies where you have hundreds of people yeah. uh, drive-in movies and the UFOs show up. So I think they have shown themselves, but they do it in ways that are not going to undermine the political establishment because they understand that if they cause a panic, there are people in the society who will react violently. And it's impossible to fight war against the extraterrestrials. But what would happen is people who are in communication and contact with them will probably get the full fury of fundamentalist Christians. You know, during the civil rights era, my family had friends who went to the Deep South during the 50s and 60s. Some of these people were killed by racist whites who called them, I won't use the word, but N-I-G-G-E-R, lovers. And there were, there were heroes of the civil rights movement who were massacred, being killed by trying to get social justice in the Deep South. Well, something similar could happen in America if you terrorize the population into thinking there's an alien invasion. Who are they going to go after? They can't go after the UFOs because they can fly circles around our yeah, They're going to go after the sleeper cells, right? That's right. They will. They will call that, and that's ex and and in the former Soviet Union, I think there are there were UFOologists who were killed by fundamentalist Christians. So it's not impossible. It it has happened. Okay, I mean that actually that actually makes a lot of sense. So, do you th get a sense that? elites are trending more toward some limited disclosure or do you think right now they're going to fight harder than ever just to give you some sense i've never seen such a stronger call for censorship in my entire life i think john Kerry made comments a few days ago at the at the wef right world economic forum where he was talking about that pesky you know he didn't frame it that way but that pesky first amendment and things like that <laughs> I like the more I hear things about shutting down speech, shutting down, the more I just want to I want to know how to contact these things because the faster that we can accelerate the demise of these people, I'm fully on board in a nonviolent way, obviously. But well, I think the transformation of consciousness that's happening in the larger society is something that's going to unfold not over weeks or months or decades, but more likely generations. For many years, I was a follower of the Baha'i faith. I'm no longer in the faith. But they had a slogan, one planet, one people, please. Planetary unification is on the agenda for a number of reasons, both spiritual and practical. We are now facing problems that cannot be solved in a modern industrial nation state. Global warming, if we're going to keep things under four degrees centigrade, and we're headed in that direction, we're already over 1.5, which was the limit set by the Paris Accords. We're going to hit two probably within my lifetime, which is the next 10 years. I'm lucky. And probably three when my grandchildren are in their 40s and 50s. And it can keep going. You know, we're facing multiple tipping points, which is the term that scientists use of a point of no return, where you get positive feedback loops the ice melts in the north. Yeah, de death spiral, basically. Right. And, and if, if we're going that, you know, you you cannot live except in highlands above four to 5,000 feet away from the equator if you're going to live on a planet where the average temperature is 10 degrees, you know, 
warmer than it is now. It's just, it's not compatible with 8 billion people living. So my, my sense is that on practical terms, we're going to have to move to one planet, one people type of administration. Hopefully, it'll be based on principles of democracy and social justice and not on the basis of oligarchic control and violence. We'll have to make those determinations in the years to come. So, so I think the UFO intelligences are very aware of the situation. You ask Grant Cameron what the dangers are, and he will tell you that during one of his communications with the, you used to call them the boys upstairs, I don't know, boys and girls upstairs, he was told in the, the following as a, a metaphor, he said, the, the, these intelligences communicated to him, don't worry, we know how to land the plane. In other words, these intelligences are working to bring change behind the scenes. And you can see it in the life histories of the people who are contact activists who came from the intelligence community, like Jim Semivan, who's a contact experiencer, like so many other people. John, Ra I'm not Ram, was the name Ramos also? Another Ramirez, John Ramirez. Ramirez. Yeah. yeah. Also another contact experiencer, like people who are so high in the academic establishment that they have been considered justly for a Nobel Prize, like Gary Nolan is a contact experiencer. So these people are being brought forward over the decades who can provide an important leadership role or an advocacy role to open this issue up so that we can have common discussion on this and not keep it bottled within national security regulations. So I think there's change. Another story that Grant likes to tell, and I don't know if it's true or not, but John Alexander is a very prominent person within the UFO community. And I met him once, very distinguished gentleman and very well spoken. And Supposedly, he was having a conversation with Jim Semivan about who's this former CIA. Perhaps he was even head of the clandestine services, although they won't allow him to say what his exact job was, but certainly a, a very high ranking official. They were having a conversation, and John Alexander wanted to know who's running the disclosure program, you know, that supposedly he was thinking, who in the government? And Jim Semivan replied, they are. <laughs> They are the, you know, they're running the disclosure project. So I think change is happening. There won't be the landing on the White House lawn, of course, but there will be a greater acceptance of the subject. And hopefully the kind of social movement that I would like to see emerge, where it will link this issue to fundamental questions facing humanity, like war, like racism, like overpopulation and global warming, that hopefully people will be able to link up and create a social movement that will change the world for the better. Now, how can human initiation contact events help with that? Well, I think we are physical beings. We have a spirit or a soul, but it's not enough to just communicate telepathically, and this is something that emerged from the free study. I was just going over, that's the foundation for research into extraterrestrial and extraordinary encounters. They did a remarkable survey uh, with over 4,000 contact experiencers that was published in a book called Beyond UFOs. And one of the questions, they had over 550 questions, it took me six hours to fill out that you know, those forms. But they asked about telepathic communication, and 70% of the people who described their telepathic communications in the multiple choice question part of the survey, they said that 70% of these encounters or telepathic communications occurred when a, a being, physical being was not there. And this was my experience as well. I received, after I started going out into the field, I started getting contact downloads where in advance of the encounter, I would have a remote view or a download where I would be told at the level of knowledge when, where in the sky and the number of craft that were going to show up. And it was like two plus two is four. You know, I knew it. That wasn't a question. And I told my team, showtime is 2 a.m. 
wake me up 10 minutes to two. At that time, back in the 90s, I was working six, seven overnights a month. I was tired. Mm -hmm. I needed to sleep, even during field work. So sure enough, they woke me up at 10 minutes to two, and the physical craft appeared. Well, for the larger society, it's nice to tell a story about what the aliens told you when you were having a telepathic communication. But actionable intelligence, information that predicts future events and is a participatory event, that makes sense for a lot of people. So as physical beings, we're going to want to have physical encounters. And although we never had the level of contact that the Rama group did back in Peru in the 1970s, our goal, as crazy as it may seem, was to have landings and boardings of humans aboard ET craft, as Rama successfully did in the 1970s, as described in their literature. There's also many videos of their encounters. In fact, I worked with Rama, and one of the people on my team was Joe Vallejo, a 747 pilot. And in 1994, this Rama group, not operating in Peru where they got their start, but met near Mount Shasta, opened a dimensional portal. And this highly experienced pilot with tens of thousands of hours of flight time got to go in with six other people to a dimensional portal that is a teleportation device, according to Rama. Their cadre, their activists, have had multiple off-planet experiences. One of their people, Fernando Lamaco, I met in 1993, a retired dental surgeon, was part of a Rama mission where five or six of their highest activists went on a mission into the backwaters of the Amazon on the eastern slopes of the Andes, and in a place called Paititi, had an onboard experience after marching 10 days into the jungle, trailblazing to get to this very remote place. You know, I spent many hours with Fernando over the years. You know, he wasn't lying. These aren't just stories. These things are happening. So levels of contact have been going on for 50, 60, 70 years. We don't get to hear about a lot of it because of the level of denial and the UFO truth embargo. So my dream at that time, back in the 90s, was to recapitulate the work of Rama. We never got closer than hovers. There were no craft ever landed, but we were also under a great deal more surveillance than Rama ever was. And my team was constantly being surveilled when we worked in the high desert around Los Angeles. I'm talking about Chatsworth near the Department of Energy site, and then also in Joshua Tree National Monument, which became a, a national park. We were near the Desert Warfare Training Center for the Marines. and 29 we, Palms, yeah. Yeah, 29 Palms, that's right. That. So we were constantly faced with not always young men, but sometimes in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, who had a military bearing, who had short hair, and one guy will look like a Navy SEAL. He showed up in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the week, in the middle of winter, and he's built like a fire plug. We had just arrived at this remote backboard in Joshua Tree National Monument where you park your vehicles and then you hike into the backcountry. And as we're arriving, he's waiting for us at this remote place. And, he, you know, the guy has bulging muscles. He's wearing shorts and a T-shirt, and it's like 45 degrees. And he says to us merrily, and he's driving a Jeep, but not a military one, you know, as a civilian Jeep. He says, oh, what a surprise. I didn't know there were other people so crazy that they would take a midnight stroll in the desert at night in the middle of winter. <laughs> that was hilarious. These guys would show up and they had a right to be there. I mean, this is the First Amendment, freedom of association. But they were looky-loos. They didn't interfere with us. And there are reasons why they didn't interfere, which are complicated and have to do with some of Stephen Greer's liaison with the intelligence community, which we can get into. Yeah. Okay. And I think we we're about to get into that segment. So any final words to the audience about this topic, about why elites are not excited about sharing the reality with everyone else? I think the caveat is that things are changing. And this has been the traditional mode of ruling class, ruling elite, power elite. But now there are powerful factions that want to move forward on this. And I believe because they are very well informed, they, these, the most powerful people in the world have the most to lose. And what they're seeing is that in terms of global climate change, we're looking at 
tremendous destruction that will make recent events that happened in North Carolina to look like a walk in the park. And so they understand that these the advanced technologies of the saucers might perhaps play a role in changing our energy economy to help us get away. They also are hopeful in other advances like medical cures. This is a whole nother subject. I could give you a lecture about the free survey that covered medical cures, UAP associated healings. Well, you know, rich people get old and they get sick like the rest of us. And if there are scientific advances that can be achieved from studying the technology and the communications from these beings, they're going to benefit from it too. And as I said, if you're rich, you, a lot of rich people think they have more to lose than the rest of us besides money. They're a mountain of things. You know? All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Burks. It was an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to speaking with you in the next episode. All right. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe, and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.